You know, should people ride the train? It's, it's part of your heritage. I know that Europeans ride the train because they pretty much have to. Americans don't have to ride the train. So why do you get on the train? Because this is part of your life. This is a part of what your parents did. It's what your grandparents did. And even if you're new to the country, this is something you can take with you for the rest of your life. It's a civilized way to travel. And I think we're losing civility. We're going too fast. You're on a part of American heritage. This is America right here. If Americans would stop, think, look, listen, you hear the train, you hear the whistle blow, you go across the crossing, the bell rings. Don't let that sound die. It's America. This is, this is what it's all about. It's stay here. This video was shot in mid-2020, at the height of COVID, which is why we're all wearing masks. Nowadays, I'm done with masks, and so is Amtrak, but bear this in mind while you watch the rest of this video. All right, here we are at 30th Street Station. We're getting ready to board Amtrak. We're going across the country from Philadelphia to Los Angeles. I've always wanted to do this, and now with the fares being so low due to COVID, now is the time to do it. I have to go out there anyway for work and a few other archeological projects. So instead of flying, I get to take some extra baggage and take the train out there like I've always wanted to. The first leg of the journey is from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, train number 43, the Pennsylvania. And we're leaving from Philadelphia's beautiful 30th Street station. Opened in 1933, it's very art deco. It hasn't changed all that much. Let's take a look around while we're waiting for our train. This panel was made in 1894 for the Philadelphia Broad Street Station. It's supposed to be the progress of transportation. We have the covered wagon on the left that actually looks like a Conestoga wagon, which was made around the Philadelphia area. I guess she's supposed to represent progress. And then she's being pulled by a chariot. And then we have a steam train. We have a steam boat. And we have a dirigible of sorts. <laughs> That's pretty neat. I believe someone was murdered in one of these bathrooms in the 80s and then Harrison Ford had to go find the killer. That's the bathroom where the Amish boy saw the guy get killed. We were just speaking with one of the workers here who was helping us with our bags and he can't talk on camera unfortunately but he told us some amazing stuff about this station. It used to be a fallout shelter during the Cold War so underneath this station it goes down like eight floors and there's tunnels all over the place. Apparently even some homeless people live in some of them. Uh, there was a bowling alley down one floor and, and behind us, uh, but that burned down. Another neat thing that he told us is that the elevators are so deep because there's a morgue on this floor somewhere, or there was a morgue, and they used to stack caskets, six of them into each elevator. My assumption is during World War II, coming home from the war, because I know this was a major transportation hub for these soldiers going to and from the war. There's so many amazing stories about this station. It has such a history that I, I didn't even know about until I was just sitting here. Now, because we are taking a sleeping car on the second and third leg of our journey, they're letting us up here into the first class lounge where we're able to sit and relax. We've been pretty much the only people in here the whole time. Comfortable chairs, charging stations, there's a computer and a printer, free drinks and snacks over there. That's pretty nice. Uh, the, the upgrade to the sleeper cars was only a couple hundred dollars more, and, and here we're traveling first class. That's, that's awesome. This whole trip for two people, three trains going across the country from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to Chicago, and Chicago to LA was only $1,100. All right, here we go, heading out to the train now. It's 12.15, we leave in a half hour. Go in here. All right. 
nobody's down yet, and then that's the cafe they'll open that a little bit later, okay? All right, sounds good. Thank you very much, Carl. Train though, okay? All right, we'll run for it. Just left Philadelphia. I think we were about two minutes late, but that's all right. Now we're heading out west. Um, we're going to be in Pittsburgh in about six hours. And I'm just watching the scenery go by. We're in coach for now, but in the next part of the video, we should be in a uh, sleeper, a roomette, as they call it. I brought some snacks with me, but I want to go check out the snack car anyway, just to see what they get. Pennsylvania. Very familiar with that town. We stopped in Harrisburg, giving us the opportunity to get off and stretch our legs. Some people are off for a smoke break. I figured I'd come out and see the city. I haven't been here in well, about 10 years. I wasn't expecting this, but sitting at the track across from us was the beautiful Pennsylvania Railroad number 4859 a GG1 built in 1937. Here's our coach car. You're on train number 43. This is the westbound Pennsylvania. Departed out of New York this morning and travels to Pittsburgh and goes basically through the entire state of Pennsylvania. There's a lot of history in this line now. The Pennsylvania just went through its 40th anniversary this past year. So the line has been here for 40 years as the Pennsylvania, but the line itself in total has been uh, running since uh, the uh, mid-1850s when it was constructed. It goes across the Rockville Bridge, which is uh, the longest stone arch bridge in the world. So you get to cross as you cross the Susquehanna River. Uh, heading uh, west, you'll cover uh, Lewistown Station, which is the oldest building constructed by the Pennsylvania Railroad, I believe it was 1849, still in use today. Continuing west, the city of Altoona was built around the Pennsylvania Railroad, housing at one time almost 100,000 people in that town, all pretty much supporting the Pennsylvania Railroad. They built uh, steam engines there, they built cars, they did a lot of their research. That's why they're known as the Standard Railroad of the World. All of the factory pieces that were done for the railroad were usually constructed or engineered or tested out of the Judiana shops there in Altoona. Continuing up the road about another oh, uh, eight miles or so is the world famous Horseshoe Curve. Horseshoe Curve constructed in 1854, taking six years to construct. Uh, the laborers, mostly Irish immigrants, 450 of them, getting a whole 25 cents an hour to construct the curve. So you went from a uh, seven day trip to a 15 and a half hour trip by the construction of the curve. So now that opened up the West in the time of expansion in America, which was, which was huge, huge. One of the National Historical Landmarks, also an engineering marvel of the world. It still is a, uh, an engineering marvel, constructed by um, J. Edgar Thompson of the Pennsylvania Railroad. He was the chief engineer at the time of the construction. That's it, here we are in Pittsburgh, time to get off. We have a three hour layover now. We're gonna go try to find some dinner and then board our train to Chicago. Tommy T. All right, thank you, Matt. You're welcome, sir. Pleasant travels. And this rotunda, I found out, is actually another historical site. This was built in 1900 and 1902 for the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the architecture is amazing. This is on par with what we saw at 30th Street Station. I mean, it's just the Pennsylvania Railroad doing what the Pennsylvania Railroad does, aside from trains. Walked over behind this Ohio Central car. I noticed about half a dozen people followed me thinking I knew the way to the train. And then when they realized I was just checking out this car, they seemed quite annoyed. Anyway, now we're heading to our train.
So we have a nice overview of the layout of the car here. This is where we boarded. We came in from this side. We have toilets, a whole bunch of toilets and a dressing room. Stairs wrap around here. This is luggage. Rooms all along here. These dark gray areas are where the trucks are. Well, you know, the, the wheels. And then all roomettes, which uh, we are in number three right here. It's cozy. It's cozy. Yeah. Had the room made over for daytime now. We will be entering the city limits of Chicago this morning through the south side. We let proceed through Chinatown, over the river into the yards, and directly into Union Station, where at that time we'll be met by uniformed right caps as well as people movers who will assist any and all of you needing help into the station. Almost had a real mishap there. I got this black bag here, this black wheelie bag. And it was similar to another one. And uh, the guy grabbed the wrong one. And I uh, managed to just, just catch him before he left. My drone's in there, bunch of expensive camera equipment. That would have been bad. And who knows what he has that he would have lost. So crisis averted. I just realized something amazing. The movie Untouchables was filmed right here in Union Station on the stairwell. I'm gonna go up and stand where uh, Kevin Costner playing Elliot Ness stood while waiting for Al Capone's bookkeeper. This was it. That's where the woman with the baby carriage was. And that's where the shootout took place. So we're in the first class lounge waiting for our train out of Chicago. They're remodeling outside and inside a lot of the uh, lounge features are shut down due to COVID. We walked around the city for a while, visited some of the sites, especially from the Eastland disaster. That's it, we're boarding. The Southwestern Chief. The sleeper cars are up at the front, so we gotta walk up that way now. We're gonna be on this for the next 48 hours or so. Alright, thank you. I run the, well, was historically the dining car here. Right now it's a sleeper lounge since the whole COVID thing. We've changed it up a little bit, but I still work in the restaurant here on the train and I serve all my sleeping car passengers and pre-COVID all coach passengers here in the dining car. And uh, I was always just trying to give the best possible customer service I could to people, you know, give them a friendly environment here. Pre-COVID it was always beautiful because we'd have community style dining in here, strangers getting to know each other at a table and have a fun time on the train as the world's going by. I rode Amtrak before this whole COVID pandemic occurred and the food was surprisingly exceptional. I very much enjoyed it. I believe I had a steak with potatoes and it was really, really good. And when I heard that my meals were gonna be included, I was really excited because I knew how good it was. Yeah, but unfortunately, with COVID, they're running with a limited menu and uh, everything seems to be pre-packaged, maybe even pre-made. So I am expecting something along the lines of airline food. I don't know, we'll see. And there we go. Very nice, thank you. 
feels pretty fresh and, and hot. I don't um, know how I feel about this one. I'm not a fan of the food so far, but this ride would be a perfect score if this meal was what I was already familiar with with my last Amtrak ride. It's just a shame about COVID. Yeah, the meals before that were nice. We actually had a team of chefs down there. You know, we were getting fresh cooked steaks. You'd have a fresh cooked omelet in the morning, scrambled eggs. Uh, railroad French toast was always a, a very big hit with everybody. We always had different dinner specials. Shoot, when I hired out here, each train had its own separate uh, special for it. So you'd be riding on the Southwest Chief and it would be some kind of black bean and corn, kind of Southwesty option. You'd go to New Orleans and there'd be red beans and rice and andouille sausage. Here, I, I worked a parlor car for years and that was another one that we had where you'd have dinner and you'd have a nice lamb shank for dinner or a, a buffalo meatloaf for lunch or a nice little like Caesar salad wrap. It was nice. The pre-made meals, they're just, you know, it's, I understand why they're doing it. But um, I, I would just hope that we could go back to the, you know, the nicer meals, and some nice little options that they used to have out here. Maybe I'm actually spoiled a little bit because I was actually just reading about cuisine on the Santa Fe Super Chief, which was world famous for its food. But you know what, the dessert looks like it could be pretty good. Let's try it. The engineer simply felt that we should have a little more ambiance for you guys, <laughs> bring down the lighting a little bit, you know, cool down all the loud noises. Uh, it should be back up in just a minute. Sometimes it happens when we come to a stop like this. <laughs> We're in Kansas City now, and uh, it's an opportunity to stretch our legs, go outside, get some fresh air. So I'm gonna go do that real quick. a unique view of the observation car. There's Emma. We're passing by so many ghost towns that I want to get out and explore. Or I want to drive back through here and check them out, but I can. Riding Amtrak through New Mexico, along the old Santa Fe Super Chief line, instead of using the standard Amtrak paper cups, I had to bring along this old piece here to drink my tea from. The Santa Fe Super Chief is one of my favorite of all the vintage American trains out there. It was known as the train of the stars, not just because of the observation car where you can look up the observation dome and see the stars above as you fly on through the desert without the city lights nearby, but also because of the many, many celebrities who favored that train when crossing the country. It would run between Chicago and LA, the same route we're taking right now, it did a single run in 1936, but in 1937 it started running regular service all the way up until 1971 when Amtrak took over nationwide passenger service. Now, Santa Fe allowed Amtrak to continue to use the name Super Chief for the train that carries along this line, but like all government-run enterprises, Amtrak declined in quality and Santa Fe revoked permission to use the name. Now in 1984, Amtrak was able to prove themselves again. They bought new cars, they upped their quality, they upped their standards, and Santa Fe allowed them to carry on the name of Southwest Chief, which is what the train still is today. We're riding on the Southwest Chief, going through New Mexico right now. These teacups are known as the Membreno pattern, which was common aboard the Santa Fe Super Chief, and it reflected the Southwest themes that went all throughout the train. Mexico now. It's got an old adobe style station, cute 
little town with old brick facades. Alternatives to Violence Thrift Store. So if you're ever getting really angry and just want to punch someone, go thrifting instead. Thank you, Rattan. You too. Okay, time to get back aboard. Heading onward. get out here at Lamey. That's a little lamey of them. Oh, funny. We're in Albuquerque, New Mexico now. We have about a 30 minute layover. I gotta get to a convenience store and pick up the Tylenol. We both got really bad headaches. I think dehydration, but I do wanna look at what these vendors are peddling. I always love local souvenirs. Got what we need, plus a bonus. Here we go, getting back to the train. Just enough time to see what the vendors are selling. that's open. They got their own bathroom in there, their own toilet, their own wash basin. This folds out into the bed. Around the corner they have a chair. Storage. Another bunk up there. That is quite nice. Maybe next time. We just arrived in Gallup for yet another leg stretching opportunity. I'm taking every one of these that I can. I've been to Gallup once before. Only a year ago I was here with Bill Sauter. We were driving through on our way out to the west coast. This was one of our overnight stops. I'm actually seeing more of the town this time and it kind of looks pretty nice, kind of cute. Nice old fashioned town like most of them along the railroad has been. Time to gallop on out of here. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. So it is now our last day on the train. And uh, we're entering Barstow, California. There's a lot of recent ghost towns along this route right now. The old gas stations falling apart, old motels falling apart. And we're uh, currently going along the old Route 66, now Highway 40. Route 40 displaced Route 66 and a lot of the businesses that were in use probably until about 1973 when the freeway opened. The Disney film Cars, a lot of, it's based on that. Uh, kids love the cartoons, but the adults I think get it that Barstow and this entire region east of here, a lot of it became ghost towns when Route 40 opened. Barstow is a, a major freight hub in the Southern California area. And to me, it's always kind of been the gateway to the desert. Whenever I leave Los Angeles and head out to camp, Barstow seems to always be the stopover. One of the original nine Santa Fe 1968 Super Chief FP45s is located right outside of the Barstow station. Before you get there, if you look at it, it's on the right side. Hopefully they haven't moved it since the last time I was here. Oh man, these are all beautiful. 
<laughs> but it's still there. It's still there. Oh, she's stunning with the light bouncing off of her. The Barstow Rail Yard featured some amazing pieces of rail history, including a 1911 Harvey House. Harvey Houses were a turn-of-the-century chain of hotels and restaurants famous for offering high-quality service along the old railroads of America, and eventually playing a part in the service aboard the actual trains themselves. This FP-45 engine was built for Santa Fe and carried on the famous red nose, yellow striping, and silver body made famous by the original Super Chief train. at Victorville and I see, I've seen train cars all along this route, just sitting in yards. But that's a very interesting one right there. I wonder what that originally was. Now, just a heads up, if you get the cereal and milk on Amtrak, in case you have any allergies, the milk does contain milk, so be careful. <laughs> As we went through the mountain pass north of San Bernardino, we entered a thick fog bank, which became increasingly darker. Some of the other passengers looked into it, and we soon realized that we were actually seeing California in its natural state, on fire. When we filmed this, it was October 2020, and California's wildfires were world news. We were close to them, but fortunately not dangerously close. I had a great train ride. Service was exceptional. By the end of each ride, you felt like you were friends with the conductors and the crew. You, you're just greeting them as you walked by, talking to them. You, almost everyone had a conversation with at least one of the crewmen. And it was, uh, it just felt close and personal and an intimate experience going across. And of course, if you're not into that, if you want to just keep to yourself, that's more than doable as well. If this, anybody, We'll have a good time on here. The train was comfortable, relaxing, um, clean. Of course, everybody messes it up over the course of a long trip, but it started clean and they did their best to keep it clean. I honestly am considering just doing this ride again and flying home right afterwards. This is that nice of a ride. Met some great people along the way, crew and fellow passengers. Had some nice late night conversations with people. It's really nice. There is a charm to rail travel still. Yeah, it's not the glamour of the uh, old 40s and 50s trains, but there is still a charm to uh, sharing a train with people for three days, getting to know them over that time, just taking in your surroundings as you slowly move across this massive country. The crew truly love what they do. It is more than just a job, but a life's passion. Across Pennsylvania, our conductor's grandfather was the conductor of the Broadway Limited in the 1940s. In New Mexico, our conductor's grandfather was the brakeman of the Santa Fe Super Chief. Whole families of railroad workers have taken on a stewardship of these rails for multiple generations. Behind me are the water channels that Nicolas Cage raced through in Gone in 60 Seconds in order to bring his unicorn, Mustang, to Long Beach in time to save his brother. From our embarkation at 30th Street Station in Philadelphia to our arrival at Union Station in Los Angeles, we spent nearly 72 hours aboard trains or in stations, journeying across 10 states and three time zones. Every passenger had their own story. The doctor traveling to California to help treat COVID, the army photographer on leave, the Mennonite family traveling to visit relatives. And for these three days, we shared a few small train cars and the endlessly rolling view of an entire continent. We got the best job in the universe right here. You can't beat it. 
you, you pay us to ride the train and to take care of people, which is awesome. I have some memorabilia that I like to pass out, I, and I do at my own expense. It's, it's just fun, because you like to see the face of the passengers and the, the kids when you hand them a golden ticket. You give a pin to a railroad or um, a postcard, uh, a coin, something that you know they can cherish or something they can take with them. I know that no one else does it, you know, because we, we believe in what we do. If you get off my train and you're smiling, you walk by us at the bottom of the stairs and we know that you enjoyed the ride, you're going to come back and you're going to tell your friends, you're going to tell your neighbors, and most of all, you're going to tell your kids. They're going to get interested in railroading and we're going to keep this part of American nostalgia going for a long time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider joining my Patreon at the link below. And as always, a special thank you to my patrons, especially Marlo Perez, Kaiser Wilhelm II, Trent Greger, Zach Richards, Tom Shavada, Donald Anderson, Cody Henricks, Joan Haynes, Rob M., Amos Mayhew, Corey Andrews, Dakota Charbonneau, Nicholas Masella, Zolt Bognar, Cole Tannock, Eric Morang, Sophie Baber, Tyler Test, Exotic Exploring, Jakob Martin Henson, Kelly Black, and Steven Schwankert. 